All right, we're back. Change some lighting so that I uh, don't fade away into nothing. And we want to do some examples with the initial mass function here. So uh, the ex first example I want to start with looks like this and says, for a saltpeter IMF, what fraction of stars have a mass greater than 10 solar masses? And for simplicity, just uh, I want to consider the range of masses to run from 0.1 to 100 solar masses. It would be 0.07 all the way up to about 300 or so if we're going to be precise. Uh, but we'll go ahead and stick with uh, this uh, simpler functional form for now. So I want to get started and ask uh, how to do that with the uh, saltpeter IMF. So let's get going. Uh, the saltpeter IMF says dn by dm has the form c star m to the minus 2.35. And so that means that in an interval from m to m plus a little delta m, there's going to be delta n stars. And this is basically a function of counting. And then we formally sort of set this up and we say, okay, we're going to let delta n uh, in the stars go there down to uh, to a differential form. And that's going to give us a equation that looks uh, like this. And whenever we have these nice differential relations for an IMF, we 100% want to integrate. So all of these problems are going to be integration problems. So let's uh, go ahead and say, all right, if I was going to figure out what fraction of stars... Uh, have masses greater than 10 solar masses, what I would want to do is uh, ask, okay, uh, we would say, well, the number of stars with masses greater than 10 solar masses divided by the total number of stars. So this is the fraction that I'm looking for has this form. Oops, we can't see that F. Yep, there's an F way over there. Anyways, uh, that fraction is going to have a mathematical expression that looks like this. We're going to say, okay, that is the integral from uh, the range of masses that I want to consider, 10 solar masses, up to 100 solar masses, of the number of stars. And I'm going to compare that to the integral from 0 0.1 solar masses up to 100 solar masses times the total number of stars. So the top one will give me the number of stars uh, from 10 to 100 solar masses, and the bottom one will give me the number of stars from 0 0.1 to 100 solar masses. Uh, so mechanically, what we're going to do is we're going to sort of do an implicit change of variables. So the m will always be in units of solar masses, just kind of keeps our uh, constants a little nicer. And then what we say is, OK, so then we'll plug in the saltpeter functional form, which is to say uh, this is going to run from 10 to 100. There go by units uh, of dn by dm integrated from dm. So essentially, that's uh, it's you know kind of doing a Jacobian change of variables thing there. Uh, so this is dn by dm times dm. Okay. Uh, so at this point, I can plug in my numbers. So I get a c star. I get a 10 to 100. Um, so C star is just a constant. It depends on the system that you're looking at. And then you say that that is m to the minus 2.35 dm all over C star, same constant, uh, integral from 0 0.1 to 100 of m to the minus 2.35 also dm. And the system's great because those constants cancel out. I never have to worry about it because I'm only considering a fraction. It's the only thing I uh, want to do. And now it's all over but the calculus. So let's, let's do some calculus. Integral of m to the minus 2.35 is negative 1 over 1.35. You'll come to love the Solpeter IMF because it's actually nice and integrable. Uh, m to the minus 1.35 integral for our evaluate at the bounds 10 to 100 do the same thing negative 1 over 1.35 m to the minus 1.35 from 0.1 to 100 so 
the next thing we do is we can cancel out those constants in front. Uh, some It makes a, a, the math a little neater. And then we will say, OK, this is 100 to the minus 1.35 minus 10 to the minus 1.35. Divide that by 100 to the minus 1.35 minus 0 0.1 to the minus 1.35. Uh, go into the trusty calculator and out pops 0 0.0019. So that, just to reflect, is the number fraction of stars that is uh, that are larger than ton solar masses. So it's about 0.2%. That means uh, for every star, uh, 400, for every 499 stars that are below 10 solar masses, there's one star that is larger than 10 solar masses. So it tells us high mass stars are rare, uh, kind of as written on the tin. So that gives us our expression uh, for the uh, fraction of stars with that mass. So that gives us one example. Uh, but the next thing we like to do is use the... Um, uh, IMF to calculate average properties of solar, stellar systems. So what I'd like to ask now is, well, what's the average main sequence lifetime for stars between 2 and 10 solar masses? Uh, and so when we're averaging, we need to come up with the idea of how to do an integral average. And so an integral average looks uh, a little something like this. So we want to figure out the average main sequence lifetime. So the relationship that we have is tau ms is equal to some characteristic lifetime. It's 10 giga years, but I'm just going to write as tau naught times the little m to the minus 2.5. So this gives us a um, expression for the total uh, main sequence lifetime that's scaled to units in solar masses. So we originally had it as tau naught times m over m dot to the minus 2.5. But uh, that scaling, uh, this variable here is what I'm calling the m in my problem. Fancy m, but given the terror of my handwriting, you can't tell the difference. So uh, uh, anyways, so that gives us the main sequence lifetime. Next, I want to consider what it means to calculate the average of an integral function. And in general, what that is, is it says that the average value of f of x is the integral from a to b of f of x times dx over integral from a to b of dx. And so in terms of calculus, what this means is if I have a little function here that looks something like, who knows, from a to b, and I have some function here, I want to calculate the integral average of this function, f of x. What I've done is I consider, OK, this is the area from a to b, uh, and that gives me this uh, area under the curve here. That's the top, so that's the integral of f of x dx. So that is this. And then the bottom term is just the length along the x-axis. And so if I take the area under the curve and divide it by the length under the x-axis, uh, what that gives me is the characteristic height of a rectangle that has the same area as the integral under the curve. So this is the average value of f of x. So that's just the integral that has the same area as the area under the curve, or the, the height of the rectangle uh, integrated over the same range. So we're going to do the exact same kind of process here to figure out what it means to do an integral average uh, using the main sequence lifetime. And the way we do that is we say, OK, the average, oops, that's the wrong color for this kind of work. Uh, so if we consider the average main sequence lifetime for a set of stars, that is going to be the integral over the mass range from 2 to 10 of the um, main sequence lifetime 
times the number of stars that have that main sequence lifetime. And then we're just going to divide that by the number of stars. So whenever we're doing an integral average, it's always what we're averaging over times the number of things with that uh, value divided by the total number, uh, 2 to the 10. So it's basically the same way we would calculate any other kind of weighted average problem, just this time with integrals. And so then we're going to break out this uh, dn into the Salt-Peter IMF and calculate the problem. So we get, let's put in our numbers, so 2 to 10 of tau naught times m to the minus 2.5, that's the main sequence lifetime, times the dn by dm for the Salt-Peter IMF, that is times c star m to the minus 2.35, and then we're going to say, okay, that's integrated for 2d uh, over dm. In the bottom, we just get the IMF. So that's 2 to 10. We don't have the main sequence lifetime. So it's c star m to the minus 2.35 times dm. Okay. Uh, so from here, we can uh, calculate the sum. We say, okay, so that uh, we're going to pull out our constants, tau naught, c star. The c stars will end up canceling. I'm going to write them anyway, so they have their brief moment in the fraction uh, sum. And so then we do the integral from 2 to 10, and then we can compound these indices. So minus 2.5 minus 2.35 is m to the minus 4.85 dm. Then we're going to divide that by the integral from 2 to 10 of m to the minus 2.35 dm. Okay, now you've had you've had your time, C star, now you're gone. Uh, then we come back and we say, okay, uh, this integral is tau naught, uh, which is 10 gig years, times uh, the integral, uh, well, we're going to do the integration, so that's going to be minus 1 over that's going to be the 3.85 uh, times m. Oh, let's let's add m evaluated from 2 to 10. Oh, oh mm, it's m to the, gotta actually give it the power it needs, m to the minus 3.85. Uh, and then we're going to divide that whole thing by 1 over 1.35, m to the minus 1.35 evaluated from 2 to 10, uh, and then we'll get an answer out. So that's going to be uh, tau naught times 1.35 over 3.85, uh, all calculated out, uh, and that's going to be 10 to the minus 3.85 minus 2 to the minus 3.85 over uh, 10 to the minus 1.35 minus 2 uh, to the minus 1.35. And then through the miracle of calculator, we get an answer that is 0 0.07 times tau naught. Tau naught was the 10 giga years. So this is uh, 7... Uh, 70 million years, 70 million years. Yeah, yeah, seems about right. Uh, so typical lifetime for a two to 10 solar mass star is about 70 mega years uh, compared to the 10 key, oop, no, 700 mega years. Okay. Yeah, you need that extra zero. Whoop, I can math sometimes. So it's 700 mega years because it's, there we go. Uh, that looks better. Uh, okay, so that gives you the age of, uh, typical age of a star. So the whole point of this problem uh, is to, one, illustrate that high mass stars have shorter lifetimes than low mass stars, but actually show how to act, uh, carry out an integral average over a IMF, and we'll need that. Uh, there's a couple other examples in the textbook that you can work through uh, or see worked through. Uh, without quite as many stammering and stutterings uh, and give you uh, the results coming back. So um, without further ado, we now know that the answer to this is 700 million years and uh, can consider some other uh, bits and pieces in uh, the study of stellar populations. So uh, the next thing to consider is that the initial mass function uh, for Saltpeter is wonderful because it's a simple functional form. There are 
other functional forms that are actually more accurate. Uh, this compares uh, three different uh, functional forms. The saltpeter is the original uh, IMF shape, but it's the least accurate. And the reason is, is that around 0.2 solar masses or so, it predicts way too many objects. So this 0 0.1, 0 0.2 range, and then drops off altogether, doesn't seem to be what's actually out there if we look at uh, stars. It turns out there's lots of things that are not stars, but have masses close to stars. So these are the brown dwarfs that we referred to uh, earlier. And this turnover in these other two functional forms, the Chabrier and the Krupa, initial mass functions, try to capture that. So there's this turnover. And unlike saltpeter, which stops at the solar, at basically the definition of a star, these objects continue quite happily into uh, the brown dwarf regime. And they actually predict quite a few brown dwarfs relative to uh, low mass stars. So we think that there are tons of brown dwarfs out there that are formed through the uh, star formation process and then kind of turned loose. It's actually a really open question as to whether you can get down to planetary mass objects being formed directly through the star formation process. So not planets that are formed just by themselves through the process of star formation that never had a host star. Uh, we could get planetary objects that basically look like Jupiter, but are not. They just formed by themselves and grew up the sort of solo, uh, the, the, you know, doing it alone, solo life of uh, young stars um, at low masses. Uh, anyways, it's an open question, but uh, the details of the Chabrier and Krupa have their functional forms outlined in the book. Newsflash, they're more complicated and doing integrals over them is harder. Uh, you can still do it, but uh, the main point of the mechanics is illustrated perfectly well with the slightly less accurate saltpeter IMF. So uh, that's the main reason why we care about the different functional forms of the IMF. Now, we want to apply these different forms of the IMF to uh, simple stellar populations to try to understand and interpret the Hertzsprung-Russell diagrams of those uh, same systems. Uh, we want to start out by examining the simple stellar population, or an SSP, and these are stars that form at the same time from gas with the same metallicity. And so that means that they all have this extra condition of the metallicity uh, variations kind of averaged out and ignored. And we only consider the difference between the stars being uh, their different masses. So all stars start a common evolution and are just sort of sent forth to uh, evolve along their uh, stellar evolutionary tracks uh, separate. So they're sort of synchronized start, but they end up in very different places because star formation forms objects of all different masses. Now clusters are the classic example of a simple stellar population. And so uh, we'll be working with a cluster precipi uh, in your homework, but there it is. Uh, it's a, a pretty close to a simple stellar population. Uh, uh, very exciting, uh, sometimes called the beehive cluster. Now, if we look at the hertzsprung russell diagram in the Gaia data uh, for this object, as you have done, uh, you sort of see an HR diagram that looks a little something uh, like this. And so this is the Gaia data. It says BP minus RP for as a function, and this is the absolute G-band magnitude. And all of these stars have different masses, and they are evolving at different rates based on their different masses. But they all started their evolution at the same time. So they can be in different stages of stellar evolution, but they all have the same age. So stars and cluster have the same age, even if they're different phases of their evolution, just because evolution depends on the mass of the star. So what we do is we see that these stars fall along these curves. And this HR diagram has this extra little red curve attached to it. And that is called an isochrone. And you can sort of, if you have any Latin pieces to you, iso is the same and chrone is like time. So it's the same time uh, that all of these things formed. 
Uh, and so they same form with a common metallicity as well. And so that's the big Z here indicates that this is the isochrone for a solar metallicity and an age of 8.85 uh, or 10 to the 8.85 years. Uh, and that sort of describes the evolution of precipice uh, here uh, in some detail. So let's take a look at isochrones. Isochrones uh, look something like this in the theoretical uh, HR diagram space. Uh, so this is the effective temperature on the horizontal axis uh, going backwards, and then the luminosity on the vertical axis uh, going bright stuff at the top. And these different curves show these different isochrones uh, here. And you see high mass stars are evolving off the main sequence faster than low mass stars. So the darker blue colors here are uh, the early stages of this cluster's evolution. And then as the cluster evolves, the stars are found along these lines. Now, this is related to, but very different from an evolutionary track. An evolutionary track has one star at a bunch of different times. An isochrone is showing all the stars at the same time. So they have these two different uh, kind of components uh, of the same, it's the same ideas viewed from two different perspectives. Therefore, when I look at an isochrome like this top one up here that has a you know, relatively young age, so this is log age in years, so 10 to the 6.5 or so, you'll see most of the stars are sitting along the main sequence with some of the high mass stars, the ones that evolve fastest, starting to uh, move off. And so these little dots here are what are called the main sequence turnoff. And so those stars are the stars that are just ending their main sequence lifetime. There's this evolution on the main sequence, and then they start uh, kind of evolving off into, uh, in high mass stars, they start doing the uh, movement back and forth uh, across the HR diagram. A little later on in the cluster's evolution, what you'll see is that they start to fill out the red giant and horizontal or helium burning branches here, and the AGB is visible here. Uh, but these are all common times. So basically everything starts, uh, and, you know, it's a kind of a race. There's a starting gun and all the stars uh, rush off and some move very quickly into different parts of the HR diagram. Some uh, stay hanging out on the main sequence. Now, the clever observer will actually note that the youngest curves have a bunch of stars down here that aren't yet on the main sequence. And that's because uh, this actually marks time from the beginning of the star formation process. And high mass stars not only evolve off the main sequence faster, they evolve onto it faster. And so these stars down here are the protostars that haven't actually started fusing hydrogen yet. Meanwhile, the high mass stars are busy evolving off the main sequence and getting ready to go supernova at the same time. Uh, so that's why there's these extra curves here. By the time you get to about 10 to the seven years or 10 million years, everything has evolved onto the main sequence. So you can really see the structure of stellar evolution here. Uh, but uh, this is, you know, you sort of think about it from a mass perspective rather than a time perspective. So let's consider like the last curve here at 10 billion years. You have some low mass stars that are still on the main sequence. They have very long main sequence lifetimes. They haven't evolved off yet. A star like our sun, which has a main sequence lifetime of 10 billion years, is right here at the main sequence turnoff. Uh, so this is where a one solar mass star is right there. Stars with higher masses have evolved faster, and so they are found populating the red giant branch or out here on the helium burning sequence, uh, the red clump, on the asymptotic giant branch, and then there'll be a lot of stuff over here in the white dwarf group for this, uh, for the um, isochrone uh, won't show that, uh, but there's a bunch of stuff down here in the white dwarf sequence as well. So this gives you a basic structure of what an isochrones are and how we sort of measure them. Remember, same ideas as our instellar evolution, but sort of drawing them requires to think about the same time rather than the same mass object.
Okay, so that gives us the theoretical view of what isochrons are. Now, now we can kind of change things up and think about things in terms of uh, actual observations. And the first thing we do is we move those isochrons into uh, the Gaia passbands. So we change all the luminosity and effective temperatures, we use our knowledge of stellar atmospheres, and we turn them into a um, basically observational color magnitude instead of luminosity temperature. And now things really start to look a little bit better. So this is the Gaia bands, these are the Gaia magnitudes, and we start to see these hooks out here to the right uh, for the red giant branch. And sure enough, if we look up here at, you know, minus one, minus two magnitudes, we really start to see uh, these uh, stars populating uh, this corner of the space. So this hook out here is just the factor of what kind of uh, stars on the red giant branch uh, look like in terms of their sort of atmospheres and their light in the Gaia pass bands. And so you can sort of see that even, you know, the stuff out here goes to G minus, or B minus R of four or so at a magnitude of you know, minus one, one and a half, two. So it looks like the typical stars in here are some somewhere between these last two color stretches, which is you know, about 10 to the nine, a billion to a few billion years are most of the stars uh, out here. So if we had a single population, it would sort of look like this. But we also have some stuff up the main sequence, filling in this space here on the s crones that has younger ages. Well, this kind of makes sense because the stars around us are a mix of ages. These are not simple stellar populations. It's this aforementioned field population, which is a big mixture. But you can start to see uh, the structure in the field population matching up with isochrones here. So I think it's pretty amazing that you know, just that one transfer into observational space, you can really start to pick apart uh, what we're seeing here. Now, the other factor that we often have to consider in fitting isochrones is metallicity. And last time I mentioned that metallicity affects the properties of stars. Low metallicity stars tend to be hotter and brighter. And this changes their emergent light. And so we have uh, different uh, kind of colors and magnitudes coming out. Uh, what this does is it shows a single isochrone for, I think this is like a 3 billion year old population in the Gaia passbands, and it's showing where uh, stars of different metallicities are showing up. So the blue curves are the lowest metallicity, they're hottest and uh, brightest, and then the uh, lower, higher metallicity stars have a lot, are a lot redder. They have a lot more lines in their atmospheres, basically pushes their uh, temperatures off to be cooler, and it makes them redder. So we'll need to take into account the um, effects of a metallicity if we do some isochrone fitting. And we will. Okay. The last wrinkle in interpreting simple stellar populations is uh, seen in the Hertzsprung Russell diagrams is sometimes there's these uh, stars that are above the main sequence. Well, what are those? Well, binaries. And the trick here with binaries is that uh, the number and types of binaries is not simple. It's, there's not like, you know, your chance of being in a binary star is just some number, uh, but that number is a function of stellar properties, specifically it's a function of stellar mass. Uh, so we just want to note this as a concern um, and uh, we sort of keep track of it because different mass stars actually are more likely, higher mass stars are more likely to be in high multiplicity system, triples, quadruple, etc. cetera, uh, systems. So the way we track that is sort of shown on this diagram. Well, if we look at the uh, number of stars in multiple star systems, binaries, trinaries, quadruple systems going, uh, going on up, and we compare that to the total number of star systems, we derive something that's called the companion frequency. Uh, so it's basically the probability of having a uh, number of companions, or what's the typical number of companions a given primary mass star is. So primary is the most massive star in the system, uh, and then the companion frequency is graphed here as a function 
uh, primary map. So a uh, big shout out here to Stella Offner and collaborators uh, who put together this very nice ensemble of everything in the literature. I took this from their uh, review that they posted to Archive. Uh, so this shows that the lowest mass systems tend to have very few companions. So if you look at a tenth of a solar mass star, it on average has 0.2 companions. So that means that typically a uh, tenth of a solar mass star, these uh, low mass uh, dwarfs, these M stars, tend to have, you know, you know, 20% chance of having a binary and maybe lower chances of having triples, etc. In contrast, something like a 10 solar mass star not only tends to have one companion, it is most likely going to have two companions uh, there. So it's most likely found in kind of a triple system and it goes on up. So uh, it's kind of crazy that we have the, you know, not only these most extreme stars up here at uh, high masses, short lives, um, huge amounts of luminosity, they also tend to be found in binary, triple, quadruple systems. Truly, high mass stars are the wildest of uh, the, the stars. They don't have boring M star lives at all. Uh, for example, uh, one of my favorite stellar systems is Polaris. It's a triple star system. So if you look up at the North Star, that's actually three stars that you're looking at there, uh, one of which is evolved and the other two are kind of in a hierarchy by hierarchical binary system. Uh, more on that in our actual in-person lecture because we have a brilliant demo uh, to show off about Polaris. But um, Per year, uh, the reality that you should take away is that low mass stars tend to be single stars, like our sun, and then high mass stars tend to be uh, in um, high multiplicity systems. In fact, high mass stars not only tend to be in high multiplicity systems, they seem to be likely to be twins, which means that they have two stars of about the same mass. Uh, below that, it tends to be kind of random draws from the initial mass function, uh, but you know the highest mass stars tend to form pairs of equal mass stars. Uh, and basically every multiple system that we look at uh, together is coeval, so it formed uh, together as a binary. You don't build binaries later after the fact. Okay, so that gives us our uh, pieces for a uh, multiple star system. We do have to take into account when we're building up and understanding stellar populations and interpreting HR diagrams. Now what we're going to do is change gears a little bit for our final topic, which is to then say, well, what happens if we can't see individual stars? We look at the idea of unresolved stellar populations. And so the diagram that you see here is an example of an unresolved stellar population study. If we look at this nearby galaxy, uh, NGC 3627, one of the best galaxies, at least in the top five, maybe top 10 uh, of you know high quality galaxies, at least in my opinion, we can take a spectrum in the optical. So what you can see here is this is the wavelength in nanometers uh, here uh, in very tiny numbers. It goes from 500 to 900 nanometers. So this is optical light. And if we look at this, uh, we see some lines from nebula. That's those star formation regions here. But we also see these dips here. And these dips are lines in the stellar atmospheres. And in fact, the overall continuum shape here is also reflective of the stellar atmosphere uh, of a bunch of stars, like hundreds of millions of stars all contribute to not quite that many. Tens of millions of stars contribute to the light uh, that we see coming from this center of the galaxy. And so we can actually learn a lot about those stars by examining the features that we see in this spectrum. So how do we do that? How do we interpret a spectrum like this? Well, what we have to do is build up what that spectrum would look like. And so we take uh, an initial mass function uh, of stars and we say, okay, that's going to make a bunch of high mass stars and low mass stars and everything. And then we're going to say, well, we know what the atmospheres of high mass stars, low mass stars, giants, all those things look at. And so we're going to match each star 
to a spectrum and then add the light from that spectrum into kind of a total average galaxy scale uh, light spectrum. So an O star would get a spectrum like this and get sort of put in there and it would get a lot of weight because that O star has a ton of emission that's coming from it. And then something like one of these M dwarfs down here or K, K dwarfs would have a spectrum look like this. Wouldn't have quite as much light, but look at all these K dwarfs. There's tons of stars to add up uh, to the light there and uh, contribute. And then we'll carry out just an average and add up the light from all of these stars and come up with a single emergent spectrum that looks like this. Maybe we'll have to add some ISM to get things right, maybe some other factors. Let's talk about that more next week. But uh, for now, let's just add up the lights of stars. And so then we can consider the fact that, well, those stars, if we start them all off as a simple stellar population and add up the light, all these O stars are going to go away. They're going to become giants, and then they'll undergo supernova explosions, leaving just behind the rest of the stuff over here. So... We can take that into account as the population ages. And this is a graph that illustrates the emergent light from a population of stars averaged up over the spectrum. Uh, so I want to call your attention to a lot. This is a really you know, wonderful figure uh, to take into account. So first off, weird units. It's plotted as upsilon sub lambda. So this is measured in lumen, solar luminosities per unit solar mass per nanometer. So it's a flux density like unit. If I divide by four pi d squared, I get my flux density. So uh, this is because this is what the model produces. Then you multiply by the mass of the stars in the system and then scale it to the distance of the galaxy. And then you can fit everything, uh, fit that to uh, a, a galaxy. So that's cool, but that's why it has these weird units right here. So don't worry about uh, the units for now. Let's pay attention to the shapes and the relative amplitudes. Well, First is, this is the ages as things get progressively older uh, going through here. And you'll start, you, you see some, uh, some obvious things. First, the youngest population, here I chose 10 mega years as the first thing to plot, uh, has tons of light out here at 100 to a few hundred nanometers. Uh, it makes sense, this is ultraviolet light. It actually gives up a lot of light beyond 91.2 nanometers and so that's what's called the balmer continuum or sorry the lyman continuum of light uh where it's giving off ionizing photons and ionizing photons are important because they hit gas in the galaxy and then they'll get reprocessed so much more about that in the next chapter but for right now uh, just note that we produce a lot of Lyman continuum out there. Notice the amplitude uh, between 10 and 100 million years. The peak here drops by almost a factor of 100. So the brightness really drops off. That's a, reflecting the fact that those O stars, they're dying. They give off so much light. Uh, they dominate the light from the population and then they're gone. Uh, and the light just drops off appreciably. So if we don't have O stars and B stars being formed in the system, uh, the light very quickly is going to change and fade away. It's going to get really faint and it's going to change in color. It's going to become really red. So here's the blue light is up here and the red light is over here. So we're going to see a shift in the spectrum towards the red end. Now you might notice all of this stuff down here. That's from uh, the AGB stars, when you know the they throw off and form planetary nebula, you get some ionizing photons from that uh, coming in here. But this is you know a factor of a hundred thousand down from the peak here, so it's not that much of a contribution. But log scales really bring up those sort of faint, uh, faint uh, sides of uh, the faint uh, light and really make you take note of it. Okay, so that gives you the general shape. Uh, gets older, gets redder. Uh, ionizing photons drop right away. And, we, and then notice we see this uh, Lyman continuum edge right here. It's also a little structure right here. Let's uh, zoom in on this uh, here. So I've taken the exact same curve, moved it over into just the optical, and then I've covered, uh, colored it with the SDSS bands. So U, G, R, I, Z's over here. Didn't show that today. And I want to kind of illustrate uh, what the light is. So this is on an absolute scale between these uh, three graphs. 
And you can sort of see that around here at 364 nanometers, there's an edge. And that's the Balmer continuum edge. So that is the energy that corresponds to a photon going from the n equals 2 state of hydrogen out to infinity. So uh, getting ionized off from the n equals 2 state. And so anything that is in the n equals 2 state will be ionized by photons kind of blueward of here. And so that leads to a little bit of opacity in stellar atmospheres and this little very discernible edge. I want to call your attention to that because in about seven or eight weeks we're going to be looking at that edge uh, from galaxies across the universe and using it to determine that there are indeed Redshift 11 galaxies running around uh, out there in the or uh, right, right there at the dawn of the universe. So, you know, it's going to come back and haunt us, this Balmer continuum edge right there. But for now, let's just focus on uh, the, st uh, the stellar spectra. As things fade away, you can see here's the Balmer line uh, they getting, they're getting they getting weaker as the stars get older. And uh, you'll notice that the G minus R color uh, is going to get larger. So we're going to lose G band light relative to R band light. It sort of turns over. And it doesn't seem super significant in this plot, the ratio of uh, here here. But again, it's a logarithmic scale. And so we're going to see the light kind of change uh, to, from a blue light when it's young to a red light. And it just shows that that color index is a really good way of tracing that uh, unresolved stellar population light. So that gives us a sense of how uh, simple, uh, single, simple stellar populations uh, kind of evolve and change from two perspectives. One, in the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, and then two, here in these kind of spectroscopic units. And we're going to come back and look at both of these in a fair bit more detail, because this isn't the only thing that shows up. We need to take into account stars being born at different ages, and that pesky dust in the interstellar medium is going to become pretty important too. Uh, but for now, uh, let's take a pause and uh, talk about some other things as we get into class. All right, thanks for tuning in. I will uh, see you in class and have a have a good rest of your day.